Okay, hello everyone. Um, I'm here with an, uh, an sort of an internet friend of mine, Michael Tessarion. Uh, we have been in contact for quite some time. Uh, hello, Michael. Hey, Jake, how's it going, mate? <laughs> well, life is going. <laughs> it's going quite good. I've been working on some stuff here on YouTube, you know, and trying to. Right. Trying to work off, you know, from the box saga lens, but to branch it off a little bit, which can be a little bit controversial within the, from the original, you know, it's so you have to be so careful with the subject. So, uh, this, uh, what do you call it? a more very slow approach, I think. Yeah, which is good. You know, it's good to do it slowly because there's a lot of information. Yeah, well, it's so much information. Can spend a, a lifetime just on on that subject, but I feel that right. the the group that has been working on it has done such immense job on it, and it, it's no yeah. use to like <laughs> invent the wheel once again, you know. No, they've done amazing work. I mean, I've got fourteen different websites on different subjects precisely because it's so hard to do justice, and you have to do it slowly, and you know, make sure people are focused on just one subject. As mm. opposed to one website with fifteen or you know different subjects all crammed into it, uh, so I chose early on to do it in this more separate way. Mm. Yeah, you seem to be very methodical in sort of trying to cat uh, put the subjects into categories. This yep. this is where I really lack. You know, I'm all over the place. <laughs> Me too. I, I had to learn it. Mm. I had to redesign sites many times, and then. Uh, some people stole my websites, you know, the people who are actually the hosts. So I've had a lot of had to rebuild many times websites and deal with these uh, hosts who don't like the, your content. Same today, like on social media, they don't like your content. Then uh, that's it. You're finished. You're shadow banned. You deplatformed. I even had that before social media. I had that with hosts of, of websites. Can you believe it? Hmm. But uh, how long have you been uh, working on like trying to get the information out and it's it's really early right Michael Well yeah before Google video Yeah It was some people put some videos up uh, on the Google video very early on um almost before anybody else you maybe some very early Jordan Maxwell videos mm. Uh, but before David Icke, you know, like maybe months or even a, maybe a six months. So because I was in Sweden one time in 2000 and nobody I didn't anybody we met in in Utebori or in Stockholm didn't even have Internet. They, they didn't have the equipment. They didn't go online. And it, it was unbelievable, you know, and from that time, exactly that time, I my first website went up in 2000. And I, I remember visiting Sweden for the first time then. And nobody was online. You know, I had to get a little part. So I was going around all the shops. I mean, everywhere, Hissingen, you name it. We had to go far and wide and to find this one part that would connect to the internet. And it was almost like nobody except people maybe in business. Uh, some of these, you know, business types had that connection, but householders did not. Same in Britain. So from very early on, yeah, my first website went up around about 98. Mm. You know, but it was very slow because... I had no money, so people were doing it for free. And then when they're doing it for free, you can't be pushing those people, you know, and they're doing it when they have full time jobs. So just to get even the site to look even half decent was two years. It took probably till 2000 before it even started to look even presentable. <clears throat> and then I had to do a lot of work through the years to add information and make it a little bit better. Mm. No, with no plan, of course, no idea. No, you started. I was just doing it. You know, yeah, but you must have been very alone in this kind of uh, 
pursuit. I mean, where do you remember where it all started with the, like the pursuit that you have been? Because yeah, it, well, that started back in about 1979 to like 1980, uh, which was a kind of a busy time in in one way, because I was trying. It was the first time I was going to America. I was you know young, and uh, when I got to America, you have more access to books than you would have had in Ireland at that time. So it seemed a little bit busy because you're getting exposed. And so, uh, you know, to new things and being away from Ireland, I was very homesick. It was mm -hmm. culture shock. And so I started to read only things on Ireland. This is in California, you know, which I didn't really like it there or more. I liked it, but I didn't like the people. So then I would go to bookstores and started to think about Ireland and there was radio stations in San Francisco that were very much based in Irish music and, and, and even some interesting sci-fi, you know, so I would just tune out, check out, <laughs> you know, of the world around me and try to, and I got into Celtic mythology, uh, which had happened just about a couple of months before I left Ireland. I got into Celtic mythology through a great artist called Jim Fitzpatrick. He's also the designer of most of the Thin Lizzy covers, the metal band Thin Lizzy. Uh, he's still going. He still get. You can go to his uh, Facebook page, uh, Jim Fitzpatrick. You know, brilliant artist. He had written uh, two books on Irish mythology, and I just got started reading those when this move to America took place. So when I got to America, I <clears throat> bought some more books on that subject, and that's it. That's basically the beginning of a true intellectual interest. Yes, in my own country, but then that quickly broadened out to you know more interest and then another subject i was studying at the same time very different was uh symbolism in advertising based in some things i'd read in a magazine and it made me obsessed and so two years later when we came back to europe to the uk i was telling all the people at the time you know these are associates about subversive symbolism about uh, occult symbolism and about subversive uh, uh, subliminal advertising no response total nobody could give a shit right so i just kept studying it collecting magazines you know it was so that was lonely yes mm. and all the way up to now it's been a lonely journey there's been no help uh for the most part you know unslaved is a collaboration uh, mm -hmm. david deals with the technical side you know uh but the content is mostly mine and therefore again yeah you know, it's not that there hasn't been some help, but it's uh, it's been it's been mostly a solo, you know, journey all the way. Designed all my own sites from the beginning, and I, I got the original designer to show me how to work. You know, front page and a little bit of Photoshop, and it's a very very slow process where people will show you things. Mostly not want to do that, uh, but then I slowly over the years learned a little bit of editing and. Oh, it's been a tremendously difficult, you know, journey all the way through. Yeah, I can imagine you have like all the odds against you almost because <laughs> this is not yeah. the, the much appreciated the kind of study, you know, that you g gain a lot of money in. I mean, you can use the knowledge of symbolism and etymology to work, you know, in the wrong way or the dark side so to speak but yeah yeah you're right yeah. actually this is of course a way to make money is to go down there but i've never done that you know i i let also see i don't advertise i just did my own thing my own way i never i never get involved with coast to coast or you know jeff rents or any of the big you know uh, i didn't sell out to any of these uh, original you know like ancient aliens uh, or uh What's that other one? The History Channel. I've been called by these people, Gaia. Uh, you know, I mean, five times last year, Gaia called me. Russell Brand has called me. I can give you a long list. And uh, I was in Sweden once on the Ustraham Gatan when I got a phone call from uh, History Channel. You know, a guy left a message, wanted me to call back. I never called him back, you know. So I have turned them more things down because of integrity, you know, Architects of Control, which was filmed in Gothenburg, you know, people wanted to pick that up and, uh, you know, hey, yeah, we'll give you 80, uh, we'll give you 20, we'll take 80, you know, I just turned them down, you know, so there's never been any funding. Everything I do is on my own shoestring. You know, now we got members on Unslaved to help, hmm. but it's always been that. I've never gone out to advertise and that's been the difficulty then because you don't get 
crowdfunding, you don't get any kind of income at all. And then back in 2000, and I think it was almost as early as 2005, a lot of internet pirating took place, you know, with Pirate Bay yeah. and lots of other torrenting and all of that. So even if you made a product, it didn't sell because everybody just got it for free. So then that makes the journey longer. I'm still going to produce my things, but now where things could have been done in months, they take years because you didn't get the income from the first product to create the second product. And these, these are this is not Big Brother. These are people. These are people who should be helping you or ripping you off like you can't believe. And therefore, your own work that is meant to help them is retarded. Nice mm. one. Uh, you have to learn all of this stuff as well. So, yeah, I'm no fan of the audience. I'm no fan of the people out there. I do my work for truth, mm. not for the human race. I can imagine there is a lot of passion there also. I can sort of relate. I do everything for free also. I have no money within this at all. It's just, yeah. yeah, I think that's a good way to start at least. Uh, or it's the only genuine way, I think. Otherwise, oh, yeah, yeah. you're going to get... many sellouts. Yeah, there's only sellouts, I would say, almost. Yeah, well, almost all. I agree with you there. And it's very, very difficult. I've, I've, I have wanted to give up more than I've ever wanted to stay involved in what I'm doing. And it really is then, you know, panning for gold in the mm. cold and wet and the rain and the sleet and the snow. And, uh, you know, just panning for a few things of gold and, and keep on doing it for oneself, you know, because the knowledge is so important. Mm. What you're getting out of it is where the gold is, not in anybody's appreciation or support. It's unbelievable. You know, you only need to look at uh, the response of social media where you're banned. You get maybe two likes on a video or yeah. one share. And that's considered, yeah, celebrate. I got 1.5 shares of, of work that has taken me my whole life. Work that is so priceless so priceless that it, it defies and then over there in the corner somebody's selling some rubbish and it's it's got a million hits so it's funny i just laugh at it so it's because it's their fucking loss not mine yeah it, it sort of end up becoming that you do it for your own sake i can't oh really, i've always done it yeah i can really yeah. relate to it i'm a musician you know and uh, i have projects on projects or maybe 50 songs recorded but i don't give a fuck about releasing them you know i can sort of rehearsal for myself with it and but you know why should i put it out there anyway yeah i mean it, it's yeah that, yeah yeah i know what you mean it's yeah. the same kind no, of no, we, thing uh, with this almost well you know and even you know it's like uh there's never going to be see you know ayn rand the great philosopher she said that you can never ever pay the hero man you know even if you gave him millions, it's still not enough. And so at 14, 15, that was my understanding that Howard Rourke, you know, her hero, heroic character, what that man gives, what genius gives can never be paid by any human being, any millionaire. It's not enough. And I agree with that. And I've had that since a teenager philosophy. And it's not just some trivial, you know, it's a tattoo. It's like, that's it. So I never expect to get anything, you know, in return for what I give out. It's just the way it is. And you have to really honor that. Mm. Yeah. And the wisdom and the knowledge and carry on with that in your mind and not be looking to anybody else. It's like the unslaved slogan, uh, truth against the world. It's uh... <laughs> Yeah, of course, that's the old Druid. That's the old uh, Druid statement from thousands of years ago. And uh, what it couldn't be better, you know, because you are against the world and a lot of people in the beginning don't feel that. And I've been, you know, pushed back. Hey, man, what does that mean? Truth against the world. What are you talking about? It's me, well, how can I explain it to you, <laughs> airhead? You give it a couple more years, do what you're doing. See, see remember, since 9-11 and now since the COVID, conspiracy has been proven 100%. Hmm. By even, you know, the ordinary guy at the bus stop, the, the ordinary taxi driver, the ordinary, you know, worker now knows that's it. All those crazy guys. With the tinfoil hats, they're all proven right. So there's your success, you know, in uh, holding to a thing long enough. And now they have to lower their eyes. They've got to look at you and go, you've been doing this work for how many years? How did you know? Or, you know, how did you stick through all of the nay naysaying? You know, how do you go from one uh, country to the other and never get to talk about what you do or meet all of these friends of a day or associates? What do you do, Michael? Oh, I'm just a musician, you know. That's lonely. That's like, you know, you can't talk to anybody. You can't 
talk over the counter or you can't talk at a business or you can't talk where you work you know at what you do no this is very private for me also i don't talk about this at work at all you know yeah. that's the way i don't know it's so private in that sense especially when it comes to like the box saga for example i mean that's it's just way way beyond in the how do you even present stuff like that <laughs> That's why I've been trying to do what I do, you know, to try to dance around the subject uh, and uh, to show the connections that you can find around it, you know. So you sort of go from the outside and draw them in if they are interested. If they're interested, now that's mm. different. You if. know, uh, so back in the 80s, I stopped talking to people because for a few years I did do publicly, you know, talk to friends about this subject. It was crickets, you know. It was very superficial interest, mm. and so I stopped. And then I never, I never made that mistake again. And I even still regret making the mistake. This is from about 1983 to 1986. Uh, after that, because of the bad responses, I stopped, and then would only speak to very, very intimate friends, you know, who could share. Uh, but outside of that, no. Uh, and then that is one of the big reasons I did like to use the internet, because mm. my alternative to talking to people in my home area later became when the internet got created, I could see immediately a connection that this is the platform to do it on globally, where you're not seeing people eye to eye, you're not shaking their hand, you're not convincing anybody. I'm just talking to this computer. I'm just putting stuff up you know, on the computer. This is brilliant. There's no human, human beings involved. Only later on, after about 2001 or two, I started getting feedback on what was on these websites because I had this disconnect that if you put things on websites, you know, nobody's watching, nobody's looking. Of course, the truth is the whole world is looking. There's people in Sweden, Finland, Croatia, Japan, you know, checking out your stuff. But that never entered my mind until many years after I'd gone public. Mm. And, you know, uh, you get people also sending you information. And I'm going, Jesus, this person read, read my website and is sending me, you know, further information that they know. Whoa, you know, so then slowly, slowly, I got a little bit more open mm. to communicating, you know, with the email and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I remember I sent you an email when I was really like stuck because I heard a really early program you did on like I think it was about Irish uh, mythology or Irish uh, about Ireland and you sort yeah. of uh, promoted that you should look in your own backyard uh, like for a concept uh, look at in, in your own country and your own yeah. town and all of this and I started to do that you know and oh my god <laughs> I mean I know in my eyes the Finland and Sweden and and this is just uh, we have been taught that this just this little country you know <laughs> with no particular influence or it's just it's just this nice little country you know but you, when you really started to look into what has been happening in the history here it's just insane what you find oh Gotland uh, you know even the Finns these people uh have no idea uh, of, of the miss you know the box act is particularly good because it it focuses on language mm. uh, when you talk about irish mythology nobody's usually thinking about gaelic language or celtic language of course it has it's very deep but when finland and the box saga yeah language is central mm. you it's a, a good jumping off place well that's very rare you don't get that i mean maybe sanskrit but I think Finland is distinctive because language plays such a role, you know, the, the primal sounds and all of yeah. that. That's unique. It's it's a really good foundation to work from. And it's so uh, uncorrupted when it comes from the horse's mouth straight, you know, like uh, with your book. And it's so fresh and uncorrupted, you know. That's right. It's genius what they have been planning because Eeyore was planned like a thousand years bef before he was even born, you know. Yeah. Uh, so it's, yep. it's really interesting that internet came in the same w at the same time as Eeyore told the story also sort of in, one uh, yeah. in 1985 I told you about the two predecessor interests that I had Irish mythology and uh, symbolism in 1985 and this is a very short time after 
the towering interest of a day every day was etymology mm. yeah it happened through a, a gentleman i knew who was a master etymologist a guy called david singer he was a, he's a, he worked for fillmore west it's a like these are very high level art uh uh, graphic arts people who work for the music industry you know people like mm. uh bill graham so this guy's a legendary poster artist right but in his private life he's an absolute monster genius with sacred geometry and etymology so i'm very young and i'm under his influence and he starts teaching me about my name the, the things that you know you never even knew existed as, as any kind of subject matter and he lived in san francisco at the time and this man was a total and utter sage and a genius. So, but uh, then he wrote down the name of several books on a piece of paper, which I kept, and I took it back to Ireland with me. And of course, you couldn't get those books in Ireland, not even a chance, you know, but I got one or two others that were like those books on, on words. But I couldn't really use it until about 1980. Uh, yeah, uh, the second journey was in, at this period in the 80s, about 82, we went back. So 82, 83, then I came back to America, San Francisco Bay Area, and I was now able to get these actual books. And I was able to get hold of a very big dictionary, Webster's uh, Etymological Dictionary, one of the best that you could ever find, you know, through this man's recommendation. He had one and I got it. And so every single day, I would just study it from morning to night. And this is when I discovered <coughs> that the English language, the debt that it plays, pays to Old High German, mm. one of the great proto languages. And, you know, the, it had a lot of uh, Nordic meanings. And I loved this. I became so obsessed with it that, you know, I became a bore because it was all I was ever talking about to people. <laughs> uh, and that so so when I later found out the Bach saga and came for I mean I'm, I'm doing even things now with yeah but you were so early with more. it I, I knew that you pointed me in that, that direction even and at that time it wasn't even a big thing you know it sort of blew no. up uh, with Jim uh. that's right yeah I, I, I was knew, really didn't know that much but what I did know was fascinating and this is one of my first studies so every time I come back to it like I'm now I look at it as very auspicious, you know, because it, it's where I started actually. Mm. And it was obsessive interest, not, not learning languages. That wasn't the thing. It was learning the meaning of words and the philology. And of course that now has come back into my work on philosophy, you know, because the manipulation of words is a big part of the materialism, you know, uh, postmodernism, uh, which hates the West has, mm. has, levied attacks on language and words and so you know back full circle trying to expose their lies and their fallacy has taken me back to the root meanings of words and stuff like that so i just look at that as absolutely amazing you know that that was put on the shelf for a while i couldn't pursue that interest in those days for very long had to do other things and then, you know, every time I've come back to language and words, it's always been at a most appropriate time. And I look at that as being like almost going back in time. It's very, very strange feeling and a good feeling. But it, it's a really, you can see today, especially in the social climate in Sweden, how they weaponize words and those Hispanic right. words. And, you know, and I'm very curious about those things and to even questionize you know to, to put that into question and perspective can be really discomfortable for <laughs> for people you know uh, well th the study of words in its say it's a very foreign concept i think uh, for a lot of is. people yeah it really is it really is and also as you say that it has this other sort of talismanic iconic now i did an article to introduce that to people who don't know anything about it it's called the age of idolatry they can get it on the Michael Design website, msar.com. Age of Idolatry. It's under the articles. And that might introduce this concept if people have never heard it before, because you're quite right. It's still something that hasn't been given anything like the, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the sort of uh, attention that it deserves. Mm. Well, it's so foreign for people. 
And even like in Sweden, we are surrounded by a lot of words that still has the heathen roots, you know, that we still use. Uh, and to just shift the perspective on some words, then they go like, aha, oh, I didn't know that. I, you know, it's still, it's there right in front of them, but they never really see the concept if you just explain it for them because it's in the word and they can understand it if you speak Swedish, you know, it's so that's loaded, right, yeah. it's so loaded. For example, yeah. the simple word history in the English, it, like it's his story. It's for the male, you know, that simple thing. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it's very, very interesting. But uh, you, s you said that you uh, w uh, have been living in Sweden. Is there a particular reason why you went to Sweden? Oh, yeah. Uh, I've always loved, you know, because my interest in uh, the Irish mythology uh, I'm a big fan of J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, mm. of uh, Kai, N Kai Nielsen, the artist, you know, so I've had, a, and I've always had an interest since uh, back in the almost 70s. So then I got a chance to go visit just as a short holiday in 2000. Uh, got to visit there and make a few friends. And I liked it. I liked Gothenburg. I loved sweet, uh, Stockholm, mm. you know, uh, and so, yeah, it, it felt right to just keep visit, go back several times and visit and all of that, you know, so I didn't quite get to learn the language, but yeah, the word roots is very important and travel around there as much as I can. See, my ancestors are from Norway okay. anyway. Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, you can clearly hear how close the Norwegian and the Swedish are. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, and I still, still yeah. want to go to Norway more, you know, I think, uh, Bergen and places like that, but, yeah, my ancestors came from there in about the ninth. They came over to England in the 13th century, probably as Vikings. You know, they were fighting mm -hmm. for Olaf the first back in the ninth century. And then they invaded, obviously must have come over to England as kind of invaders or whatever. I've got, I've got, you know, like they had a coat of arms. Oh. Uh, so there's, you can easily track them, you know, in That's a genealogy and then like so many other families, they must have lost a lot by the 1700s. And that's when some of these people moved over to Ireland for some reason. We don't know really. We don't know if it was a man. We don't know if it was a woman. But the Irish connection, they went up north. And so they were Norwegians. And they moved into Ireland, went up north. And then we have, you know, several family names, derivative names uh, that we can check, you know. So that's that line. And my father was a very, like six foot blonde, blue eyed, big boned. You, you, you mm. couldn't tell the difference between him and some Norwegian fisherman, you know, type of, and all his fathers were the same look, mm. well, you know, so I always had this hankering. And then with the fantasy side, you know, the Tolkien, the legends, the Kalevala, yeah. all of this uh, fascinated me. Uh, Kai Nielsen's artwork, you know, I was really fascinated with that. And uh, every time I saw Viking artifacts, especially Viking jewelry or Viking pots, their silver work, any Amazing. movies on the Vikings, you know, it was really like, whoa, who are these people? And of course, all the lies that were told in England about them, I kind of knew to keep that in mind that one day these lies will be overthrown. And I'm sure they are, they have been overthrown. They know that the, the whole story of the Vikings in Ireland and in England has been largely falsified. Yeah, uh, you can see they are rolling out even harder on uh, the lie yeah. with the Viking shows and all the different kind of Norse shows. Yeah. I am I am allergic to those fucking yeah, shows. Yeah, I hate them as well. Yeah, because I guess nothing but lies. Yeah. They don't want people awakening. They know that in the underground, people are getting into the box saga. They're getting into you know the real lore of the area, mm. the Goths. They can't you know the whole story of how Goths came in into the Roman Empire is all lies. So, I mean, it's really deep. It's really, really deep. I, I've got the works that show that those lies, but uh, then how, you know, I'm still waiting on, on slave to get, there's so many things on the conveyor belt to get to, and some you just have to shelve for another five years, you know, but um, I'm just hoping that members have, will stick around and wait for it because you wouldn't believe I've got work on South Africa to get into. I've got work on, uh, the story of the Goths in relation to the Roman Empire and all, uh, I've got 
tons of work on the Ottoman Empire, you know, the Turkish Empire, mm. and uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, all the fall. Uh, and I've had all of this piling up, you know, uh, keep methodically doing it. But I've got two new books coming out, so I'm trying to prioritize those. They're on philosophy right now. So there's certain things get in the way, and you just have to park the other stuff, you know, and just hope that your viewers will have the patience. But, but it's all A1 stuff. I mean, this is going back to old chronicles and texts, but it's also the best of the up-to-date works that are being written right now by great men, you know, on socialism, on fascism, on these uh, uh, empires. So I'm incorporating old stuff that's long forgotten, that's masterly work that they don't want you to know about. And I make sure it's up-to-date with the latest works of great authors, you know, and I try to put a book list mm. every now and again on Unslaved so people can see some of the books, not all, that I've read on these subjects. And one day, you know, these are going to be in presentations that will be second to none, but they're, they're on their way. I think you're doing a really good job uh, with like bringing forth, so you don't need to do all the research. You bring forth the old, you know, stuff that is, has already, already been made and you sort of yeah. compromise it into one sort of pillar. And I, I really appreciate that because, you know, I wouldn't be where I am or where, what I know today without your work, Michael. So a really thank big you. thank you. I mean, it's just in, incredible. Well, it's so much work, you know, and it's uh, very sad to see that years. Well, this is the story of my life anyway. Uh, re recently, things have actually been better. I don't have to wait five years, you know, but still there's a bit of a creeping wait. Not as long as it used to be. That was the biggest problem in my career. If somebody said, what's the biggest problem you've had in your career? Well, one of them is this problem that I've had an idea back in the 80s and it's had to wait 10, 12. Tw the things I do in female psychology, for instance, mm. you could say that those almost, well, I can give you exact dates. I studied this stuff in 1989. So just you can work out how long it's taken to even do the first website on that or maybe the first interview on that. You know, it, it's, and, and other projects have been similar to that. And there's still stuff on the shelf that I haven't had time to get into. So I just have to forget about worrying about it and just say, there's nothing I can do about this. So just keep studying it, you know, keep <laughs> making notes and one day it'll be presented, but try to organize things so that the most important things coming out sooner. Mm. And that's what I've done. And so, you know, I've been fairly happy with that. It's mostly that has come true. And so it's, it takes away the bite. It takes away the, the, the worry of saying, oh my God, this has just taken so long. Again, 30 years of that. But now it's it's not you know because of members because of a little bit more interest mm -hmm. uh, in these works and again you know other social things that are happening has made it a lot easier in that sense but yeah i, I just i can't tell you how many fantastic things we've got in the pipeline oh that's nice to hear i was uh, gonna ask you the old town especially in stockholm is drenched with this uh, symbolism for example uh is this something you recognize at this stage when you were living there? Oh, yes, yeah, uh, in Gamla Staden, Gamla Staden yeah. and also Riesen. Yeah, uh, that whole area is filled with obvious, you know, uh, symbolism. It could be m a little bit later, like 18th hundreds or whatever, 19th century. Mm. But when you see these crowns, the three crowns, or you see the horse and the unicorn, and various other symbolism you know it's part of uh some of it some of it remember the, the stuff that actually interested me mostly was the secret society mm. you know symbolism saying gothenburg right nora gotan you've got near brunsparken you've got the uh knights of templars yeah uh building and of course it's number 33 just has to be number 33 <laughs> nora gotan right Are they, yeah they don't miss a beat you know, or uh, you've got the odd fellows. And this is then how, you know, and there's a big double headed eagle. Uh, yeah. And so same in Stockholm, you've got this and you've got lots of these bizarre Swedish, even secret societies that are not known to the rest of the world. So yeah, this they... was what fascinated me, you know, and of course, Swedish society is very stratified. You get the ordinary, you know, ignoramuses down below, and then you've got this elite class. They claim to be socialistic and communitarian but of course there's a big glass ceiling between those who are really in high positions yeah. and banking and corporations and charity and then the rest of the you know the people below 
who are just completely oblivious. You know, they think they're living in a perfect socialistic utopia and helping everybody else in the world and all this nonsense. Well, it, and then it, you've got. Yeah. <laughs> so it turns out that the Sweden is like built on Templarism. That uh, pyramid structure. Yeah. Uh, you can yeah. see all the Vasa kings were high Templars. I think they yeah. even were the Templars or the. You, it's it's very easy to say Templars, but like the upper echelon, because it, it's really interesting. I'm working on a documentary on this that really exposed them for a oh. while. Yeah, it's about the power shift when the Vasa was uh, taken out, you know, where by a nefarious group, and because of uh, Sweden or Stockholm is so small. Uh, especially during that time, we can really easily trace the actors and uh, who did what and uh, all of this. But uh, it's a really interesting uh, subject that I've been working on uh, for the couple uh, last couple of months. But it has well, always been in like the back burner for a while. But I I have not been ready to present it, you know. Oh, well, people need to hear it. Yeah. This is such an important project you're working on, you know. And the Wallenstamm, you know, Wall these would represent Wallenberg. the, the Wallenbergs, and then mm. you have the uh, Chalm the, the Chalmers, right? Yeah, but the, because yeah. of the power sphere is so small, it's very easy to study them, and uh, you can see that the actors behind the assassination of the Vasa family is the Wallenbergs and others. Yeah, so that's it's right. Re it's really easy to see, and they of course took care of the banking and the creation of money and they are still in the power today so it they have been having that that kind of seat and built a dynasty from that yes and other assassinations i think the jesuits were behind the killing of olaf palma you know things like that yeah, probably uh it's you a know, yeah but there's the, a lot of interesting connections the interesting thing is that i go from the 1500s you know where the vasa took power and the uh, try to trace it through uh, the sense uh, but it has been leading up to today's situation so i can see sort of see the uh, his uh, the storyline from the, the vasa dynasty and what they created which was built on this uh, this more pagan because gustav adolf the second for example he came with this uh, uh, military system for example that is purely based on the pagan military system and uh, taking knowledge from before from paganism and sort of making a mixed version and using that uh, knowledge to build and create society from but in a more modern tweak so to speak so uh, yeah it's yeah. a very interesting uh, uh, <laughs> subject to study i can well tell. Uh, near the statue in Usterham, God, oh, it's on the avenue Oh, Avani, right in uh, Gothenburg, mm -hmm. they have a statue of Wallenberg, and there's a, some very interesting eagle and a big ball, and some very very weird I I symbolism in that area around mm -hmm. that statue. I need to check that out. I, I need to go. I have yeah, been Avani, uh, yeah. The interesting thing about the architecture in in Stockholm is that they put history into monuments and uh, sculpture you know into the facade or the architecture there yeah so you can work as yeah. a guide there if you know about the history and symbolism you can go oh, around yeah. and just give on a tour for a couple of hours really easily so it's, it's such yeah. a yeah. built in such a nice way in that sense yeah yeah that's right in 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 you know in the center where they have the government buildings mm. that's really beautiful there you know and the, the central castle and everything yeah uh, this is really yeah just stones throw away from gamlestan it's yeah. really really nice everything is so compressed uh, down there and uh, you know it's so interesting to see because i traced this up to the today you know so it becomes very interesting i even called out you know this uh, infrastructure um, uh, sabotage with the North Stream there that was happened not so long time ago like last week uh, like mm -hmm. a, a couple of weeks before I said uh, I predicted that there was gonna happen some kind of uh, shift within the infrastructure when it comes to energy and uh, or uh, and internet something in between there because they are the key on po uh, they are like the 
the guys behind all the pipelines and you know the infrastructures that you can see with the power lines the the Ericsson company ABB and all those you know actors Is that right? yeah you can see that they have 43 percent of the in infrastructure in the world when it comes to telecom and they, they have been <laughs> Ericsson mm. is 160 years old they were the first with power lines in Sweden and such really yeah so it's a, it's such an immense study and you almost drop the, drop your cheek when you understand that the power uh, that is sort of residing from stockholm with the central bank there and all this it has ties to the 1600s with the vasa family in the 30 years oh. wars and all of this so you can see everything seems to be tied to stockholm it's yeah immense. I, I oh yeah yeah. And if you go up to, you know, Prince Eugene's estate in Stockholm as well, it's very interesting symbolism there. Very a lot of astrological, astrotheological symbolism. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, but this is just... <laughs> it just shows you that these elites there, you know, the royal royal people was very familiar with I mean, look occult at the, symbolism. Look at SAO, for example, which they had uh, the old Norse uh, symbolism within their companies. You know, oh, and yeah. they use it. They're using all of this old Norse uh, symbolism, and they, and they know how to work with it. So, yeah, they do. So yeah. the, it's very interesting this this subject or the study of Sweden because the Wallenberg motto is to uh, att syna eller att verka utan att synas, which means to act without being noticed. That is their family motto. And that's a Fabian, right? The sheep and wolves clothing, same symbolism. Yeah, I've been trying to trace them. They they have some Jewish uh, background. Uh, yeah, actually. yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're not Jewish. They're Sabbatean. This is a different thing. They were called some kind of they. Uh, I think they are uh, connected with the Rothschilds and those kind of Jews. Uh, yeah, that's right. These are all Sabbatean families. They're they're not Jews. They're Satanists who hide behind Judaism. Mm, okay. Yeah. Well, that's a. I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm going to try to do as much of honor as I can to the subject, uh, but uh, I think it's going to, it's new information uh, that uh, there's a lot of books has been written on, on the Wallenbergs and this kind of power structure that Sweden resides, but it's all in Swedish, you know? Uh, so I, yeah. I wanted to sort of present it for the like Americans and uh, the, in English format. Oh, that would be absolutely brilliant project. Yeah. So I'm not uh, I'm I'm not inventing the wheel here. There are very promising uh, character from Sweden that has been doing obsessive work on this for for a reason, you know. So it's just sad that they have mostly in Swedish or like almost hundred percent in Swedish. So. Sure. Yeah, this is a very important uh, role in life. Uh, I do it too. Mm. Is to take you know unknown person or somebody who slipped away used to be famous, but they're not famous now. And I try to get their work back. And sometimes it means retranslating it into a more of a modern idiom. Mm. Uh, you know, yeah, this can happen because even just in a few years, the language that somebody's written something in can be obscure to people. And, uh, you know, you, it's up to somebody else to come in to, you know, and when I was in Sweden, remember, I had the fortune of meeting with Yuri Lina, you know? Oh, you did? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, He's nice. a friend. And uh, we talked, and he he was having that difficulty. So he had this uh, translator, you know, who was working for him to, because he had been access to KGB records, mm. and he had it was all in Russian, right? So he had to translate from the Russian into Swedish, and then somebody had to take it from Swedish and turn it into English. So. This, of, this often happens, you know. Mm, yeah, and to make it in like that uh, format that he has, I know I have his book, uh, this uh, in the sign of Scorpio, which is a really masterpiece, I think. Uh. Yes, of course. See, and uh, we talked about that. He came to a house. Uh, I was staying with a man, you see, who had got the first occult conspiracy bookstore in in Stockholm. And he had to close it. He had to close it down because the Swedish media kept sending these idiots with microphones and making fun and putting it on the headlines. And he is the first man to host David Icke in Sweden oh. as well. So yeah, so I knew him, and he told me the funny stories about the media with secret microphones and look what they're 
got here, you know, secretly filming the bookstore, and he just got fed up with it, and he didn't need it, so he closed it. But it was kind of funny, and uh, he told me about, you know, how Sweden is so backward. Mm. But he also had some inside scoop on the Wallenbergs and you know the Chalmers and a lot of good stuff about history. Mm. Well, it's it's a perfect uh, country to examine because it's so small, and that, like I said, and it's easy to track. And but the 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 result of the what you find is so you can't be, almost believe what you you're finding because it's in your face. If you go into the Wallenbergs.com, they show it all to you. I mean, if you yeah. just look at their website, they tell you everything. It's it's. <laughs> It's even a three-part documentary on the SVT, so the nation, what do you call it? The public service channel we have, the Swedish yeah. television. They have a three-part documentary on the Wallenbergs. It's basically the Sweden's mon- modern history. I, I mean... Yes. <laughs> this is what I also found out when I was studying the Rothschilds and the Warburgs. Even the official biographies tell you nothing about... tell you. All they tell you is about the crime of the family yeah. and their glory. They love to tell you about how they destroyed a stock exchange, how they made money from you know crimes and, and destroying other companies. Uh, you know, Lady Rothschild signed off on one of the books, gave approval to a doc to a book that is actually you know tells you all about their banking crimes and everything. It's so funny. Yeah, and people call you a fucking conspiracy theorist. I when, know when it comes from the horse's mouth itself. I mean. Yeah, it's just unbelievable. Now, this is one of the reasons. That's right. Now, that's one of the reasons that I only specialize in those official biographies. Mm. And when I bring up quotes, then I got I got acu- accused for that. First, it was like, <laughs> Michael, you have no sources. Then when I bring in the sources, I get accused for even putting in the sources. Yeah, because it's rubbing your own shit in your face. When I when I show you from official sources and official biographies or from top generals or from top statesmen, all these things about the club of rome and you know uh, the illuminati and all of this stuff for you know dukes and princes are saying it in their writings watch out so this doesn't make you many friends you no. know uh, but i love doing it because i, I never get then any feedback nobody comes after me they they have to you know pretend they didn't exist <laughs> but uh, michael a little bit off topic but you're also into like music uh, like metal or hard rock music and all of this because I come from that back- background, and it's sort of an attitude there that you don't give a fuck about approval. You don't give, you know, certain approval, of course, that are respected from your side. But it's it. That's my attitude, and it sort of has been lingering into this also. You know, it's um, it's sort of a, I don't know how to call it. It's very this Viking image that they show on like the television for sure. I hate the show, but this kind of uh, integrity uh, and uh, fear, oh, yeah. you know, that yeah. that's well, a... the bands. I, the bands I like to listen to are the ones who have integrity. Mm. And I've met Lee Edling, you know, from Candlemass and Masai McCollin. I've met some of these guys and I know they're true. And so generally speaking, their message is really good. Uh, you know, I like the bands with the occult message or whatever. Mm. And uh, we had a really great talk with the guys from Candlemass about, you know, the Rig Veda and the Indian Upanishads that they're drawing upon in their lyrics and also many Swedish poets that are not remembered anymore. Not just Bellman and the famous ones, but others, Mm. you know, he's drawing on this. So this is what I love. I love poetry being put to music. And I like the heavy music because if Beethoven or Handel was living today, they'd be in the heavy metal. That passion that intensity yeah. and then as you say oh yeah the, the idea of being an outsider yeah. of trying to find an, an image that <clears throat> you know ronnie james dio once said that it's not evil music it's medieval music and he was so <laughs> right and he said and it's about chivalry and it's about you know man man being man and heroic and standing up to evil and pushing back at it uh, 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 not letting evil run the world and all of this so you know this kind of thing very yeah and for all, also from a musical point of view always interested me you know the complexity people often don't realize that heavy metal first you know that kind of rock is quite uh, 
difficult to play and all of that. So, mm. yeah, and especially bass guitar, you know, I, that's why I started with his bass. Uh, you know, looking at people like Geddy Lee and trying to, you know, see these heroes and try to play like them and what have you. So, but yeah, that's a very big part of my life because it gives you the strength to carry on. It, you know, just when you feel down and you feel like, okay, this is, you know, over, it's not worth it. There's something about metal music that it encourages you. Yeah. It sort of um, encourages you and keeps you enthusiastic about what you're doing. Yeah, it, it, I can very much relate. I come from the more electronical side when I was uh, younger, you know, but I sort of graduated uh, towards uh, the more... I skipped the rock era mm -hmm. <laughs> totally and went straight into Amuna Marp and, you know, this kind of more death metal, mellow death. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the extreme metal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it was oh, yeah, a lot yeah. about the image, you know, with the, my friends also. Trump, also, they had so much integrity. I felt with this when I started at the gymnasium or what you call it, the high school or whatever. I mean, I met the friends who were into metal, and they had so much integrity. Those people, and I was sort of uh, that was a, a really, I gravitated towards that, you know. With it, it sort of gave them the integ integrity also <laughs> to be an outsider. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I didn't have too many. There was people in Belfast, of course, but because of the violence and the troubles with the bombing, bands didn't come there, and so uh, they were too scared. Uh, there are exceptions, uh, but vast majority of bands would not go there. They go to Dublin, you know, which for us was a long journey, and we didn't really want to go there. So you're missing out a lot. And I think that helps because then when a band says, fuck it, we're going like Metallica, you're like, what? Or <laughs> Man of War, you know, they're, they're like, they're, they're coming here. No way. You know? And so you're like, you, you've become very passionate about these guys because they, they have their guts, mm. you know, and you had rock bands and you had, uh, oh, all sorts of different, you know, there were a few now and again that seemed to not care about the dangers and were very happy to be there. And that you could see that they were happy to be there on stage. So these wet, you know, wet, rainy nights in the winter, you know, and there'd be a band that would come there. You, you really, you know, from Germany or wherever, and you'd really just couldn't believe it, you know, because there was a tremendous embargo and a great, great fear. So, but it wasn't that that got me into that kind of music. I, I got into the artwork. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Funny enough, album cover artwork, and the you can get big. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And you can get big coffee table books, which I had in America, you know, on artwork. And I would study meticulously the artwork. Was, I'm not a good artist, but I'd love looking at art. And so these art covers, I noticed that in rock and heavy metal, they seem to be even more captivating and interesting, you know, like physical graffiti or uh, uh, you know, wishbone ash covers, uh, candle mass covers, you know, uh, candle mass even use covers from, you know, classical art. I mean, from, uh, you know, Thomas Cole, Thomas Church, really, really special art. And I love that idea. And then if I, if I saw an album cover that I liked, I'd want to hear the music. Yeah. So it's 50, 50, 50. Usually you listen to it, it's absolute rubbish. It has nothing to do with the cover. But then there's that other 50% that does, you know, resonate. That It was picked carefully. Uh, the artwork was done with great, you know, care. Uh, and it does fit the music. There's so many examples like that. And then, you know, yeah, wow, that kicks ass, you know. So it was mostly through the artwork and then slowly went into more extreme. And then, see, during the 80s, the music was so soft mm. and so hair bands from L.A., you know, this kind of crap, that then I got into the extreme music like Venom, and Bathory and King Diamond and Merciful Fate, you know, and other bands that are heavier because as a contradiction to the shit that was, you know, these Motley Crews and this fucking poison and all that <laughs> rubbish you know cinderella and all this crap that just junk you know uh, <laughs> and so i got more as soon as i heard the heavier stuff friend of me friends friends would play the heavier stuff i was like what the fuck is this right you know and i, I really like that more and that kind of put us a little bit different in belfast because there was only a small group of people who were into that more extreme music you know mm. Well, I, I sort of just think about uh, this Dio album cover of uh, the whole, where the whole diver is, you know, yeah. swimming from the devil there. Uh, 
I remember my mother brought this uh, tape uh, CD and it's the first song that I really remember, you know, as a child. Because your I mother l listened to music like that? Yeah, yeah, she had this uh, this album and uh, <laughs> I wanted she, uh, her to put this on because I was so captivated by the by the artwork, you know. So I can really but I this is the first song I really remember as a child, you know. Did you feel that the artwork captivated yes. the music? I was uh, I was like uh, mimicking this whole diver swimming on the floor, you know, <laughs> getting away oh from from the chains. Yeah, because that, that visual <laughs> does have a big effect. <clears throat> oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, I can tell you, I mean, for me, even if it was a very basic album cover, it didn't matter. Something about the aesthetics <clears throat> would very much, you know. Now, there's a couple of shops in town because, you know, we're on the door, had no money, right? So you just can't go buy an album because you like the album cover. But there were some shops in the 80s in the, in, that would put the album on for you. So at least you could hear one song or, you know, if it wasn't busy. So if you go down there and it wasn't busy and I, I, I got thrown out of all the shops in Belfast, you know, <laughs> all the pubs, all the record sh shops, because I'd be constantly fighting with people Oh. in those days. I was a very kind of different person. And uh, but this one place I went in, you know, see a Candlemas album. Oh, they got a new album out or whatever or Onslaught or whatever. And if they put it on, then you could go, whoa, you know. And then I had a, a cousin who had more money and he would get like Death Angel or, you know, he'd come up with like, like he would he would be able to buy more albums than I could, you know. So I, I learned his technique of just, you know, going and getting the person in the shop to stick it on. And uh, if you got very lucky, you know, you'd find a shop that would do that. But within one year, I was already banned from pretty much every shop in Belfast. So, it was very, you know, couldn't go in. Because if you go into the pubs in those days, they wanted you to drink. But if you brought something in from the outside, like a Coke or whatever, they would, you know, get into a fight or they they try to confront you about drinking mm. inside. And anything that ever happened like that, I would just go ballistic. Uh, you know, I, I learned later on to just calm down. So then the next thing you know is the bouncers are throwing you out. So after one year, I'm already out of every single shop for breaking their rules or causing a fight or, you know, just telling them where to fuck off, you know. <laughs> You're a rule breaker, Michael. Can you... I was like so much <laughs> of a rule breaker. So I ended up being, you know, isolated. There was only one club I could go to and I just always kept calm there. You know, this one club that played all the bands that came to Belfast. If they weren't playing a big stadium, then they play, you know, one or this like small club. And so if you wanted to get in there, you had to be calm mm. you know. but did, did you so have luckily, a lot of uh, like underground scenes and uh, you know yeah yeah this big of... underground scene yeah okay yeah we had a place called the labor club it was a kind of a communist club where local bands and british bands would play then there was a place called rosetta bar where creator and death everybody from all around the world you know would come to play there like amana marf you know and uh amana Sabat. Marf, yeah yeah they'd play this club the rosetta bar I uh, love them. So there was, yeah, you know, it was was not as good, say, as London or anything. But, yeah, we had a bit of a scene, you know, and uh, most of the bands were crap. You know, you wouldn't go to watch them, right? But there was the odd one that uh, stuck out. And then you had the big concert halls, you know, where the Michael Shankers and, the, mm. you know, uh, the bigger bands would come to play like Exodus or even Black Sabbath, Iron Maiden, Kiss, you know, uh, I was, I'm not into Kiss, but I went anyway, just so that I could say in my life. And also I was very, very depressed during that period. And I just wanted to get out of the house. So the whole town was going to see Kiss. It's like something in the Scandinavian, you know, everybody's going right. Or Ulevi. So I, th I thought, okay, I'll just go. I'm not interested in the music, but I'll see some of my friends and just have a day out, you know? So a lot of times I went to see bands that I didn't even care to see. But it was just to get out of the house, you know, such depressing times. And mm. remember, I'm talking about times where there was the violence in the streets, the troubles. And so, you know, there wasn't much pickings. There was nothing to do, really. And there was other problems as well, you know, to stop me going to places. And it was very, very difficult. So when a big band came, you know, sometimes you just spend the money just to get out of the house, even if you didn't really care for the band, you know. Oh, I see. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I got to think about uh, we had a 
you know, a big underground scene when I sort of grew up in my 20s, uh, here, here in Umeå, where I live. But um, th- it sort of got totally killed when uh, Umeå became like the cultural uh, capital of Europe when we entered oh, EU, no. they killed off the Kulturnatta, which was a night where all the bands could play all over town, you know, there was uh, different stages all over and yeah. people could play and show their music, but all of this got killed the minute that I- Umeå got this uh, status, so to speak, I think. It's See, this happened in England w- because of the terrible state of cities like Belfast, which is probably one of the worst for dilapidation and filth and dirt and corruption. But you also had this in uh, Manchester and Liverpool, Sheffield. When all the new money came in to make it better, I think it made it worse, right? Mm. From an architectural point of view. But when all that money came in and they made these boardwalks and they made these new centers, that happened there as well. So all the all the extremely good, you know, new romantic bands, and all of the uh, sort of uh, underground bands and even the metal bands, that was it. Mm. And also the protocol at the actual venues was bad, even for the bands. Uh, I've had people, you know, tell me, like Lemmy from Motorhead and other bands, that when they get to these venues, there's so many rules inside. Like, you know, hey, we're going to close up at 11. Get your shit off the stage into your trucks and fuck off, you know, this kind of thing. And they'll turn the lights off. The band is barely off the stage going back to, you know, shower or whatever and the fucking guys are knocking on the door going we're closing <laughs> so you know this this all of this has been you know a problem and then ireland had a problem too because if a band came these promoters and agents would always purposely put bands together that were totally unlike each other you get this at the the famous donington rock festival in in england were the what do you call it the lineup or the list of bands yeah uh, you know uh, see because now it's better right if you go to sweden rock or vakin yeah yeah or bloodstock there's a bit of you know coll- collusion the sound sonically they all sound like one genre but in the 80s and 90s all these dissimilar bands who should never have been on the same bill were put on the same bill by these promoters so if you was into metal you'd have to sit there and wait for four bands to get off the fucking stage you know, before you saw something that was better, right? And in America, they kind of did that too. But closer towards the end of the 90s, that stopped, you know, and, and it was better. You could see, say, Morbid Angel, Pantera, and Black Sabbath on the same bill. You could see Slayer, you know, with some good support bands. But in Britain, it was not like that. It would be all mixed up with crap bands along with, you know, a brilliant band. And it was the same in Belfast. And it was kind of agonizing because then what you try to do is go late. But if you go late in Belfast, then you're at the back of the hall. Mm. Well, and, I, and since uh, it's always raining in Belfast, you can't go late because then you're going to be soaking wet. You know, you want to get in out of the rain. And that means going in early. You know, And then if you go in early, it's nice because you get up front, right? But if you get up front, then you're watching five shit bands and you can't move, you know? Oh man, I tell well, you. I, I can see this sort of happening in Sweden now because it's about quotations. You know, uh, the in the metal scene, for example, it's the majority men often uh, playing the music, and uh, mm-hmm. they get like a cultural support uh, in form of money. You know, uh, but if you don't have a woman on stage or a transgender or anything, the you know the the arrangers of the of the festivals and so will get a really hard time and the tickets will be very high so this has been really a struggle for uh, we had a like a festival here in the town where i live called house of metal which is uh, i go to that like every year but now the tickets has been rising and the, it's big problems around it because uh, of quotations within the within the artist scene and uh, I think it's only like pri- private heroes, I would almost call, that uh, is uh, st- uh, really making it possible to even have a platform for bands to play on these days. So it's uh, yeah, yeah. It's and really these promoters hard. don't. The promoters don't like metal. They never have, and they never will. So anything that they can find to mess it up, you know. Now there, there are exceptions, but 
generally, uh, although they might want to always ride the train, the gravy train, when they see that that kind of music is back, yeah, sure, then you'll get them doing this and that to make themselves wealthy. But that doesn't mean that they give one shit about the music. And metal has always been the underground music. It's always been the underdog music. Mm. And it never really had its day. People have a false impression. Yeah, shit metal had its day, you know, because of Hollywood and because of crap videos. But such excellent bands who just blow your mind, you know, never really was able to get the, the promotion that they deserve. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, that, yeah, it's always been an underground music. That's what attracted me to it. Still does. You know, I think that uh, uh, there's even some bands that are into, you know, alien visitation, genetic manipulation. Yeah, they Peter Katrin, yep. uh, pain artist there from Sweden. He is he 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 made a color, uh, collaboration with the Rammstein uh, guy there. But as soon as he made a song about the uh, like the medical uh, industry situation, they you know he had to go his own way. I sort of got that uh, impression, but uh, you know there are r real heroes uh, in this uh, music st uh, scene you when bet. it comes to you metal. Bet. I mean, oh. Pain, uh, Hypocrisy is the ba band. It's really, really good. I can recommend. Yeah, Hypo yeah. yeah, I can. But There's uh, uh, you know bands who've sung about Illuminati uh, at great risk to themselves. Mm. You know, uh, and so yeah, they're, they're, that's the kind of stuff I like. Hey, Yaki, I'm going to have to get going Yeah, soon, yeah, but... I was uh, th telling you that we should round off here, but this was uh, really interesting. We get only scratching the surface, really not get into stuff. But I, I would like to, you know, just to see who you are as a person also, Michael, because you're always <laughs> this big canon of just information and knowledge, and I thought it was yeah. nice to scratch the surface a little you bit. You bet, mate. Yeah. yeah, especially on your show, I'd like that. And we can do a part two anytime. Yeah, that would be nice. So we could maybe I wouldn't wanted to talk a little about about the draconians. Maybe it's a heavy subject, but uh, yeah, I want to get your take on that for later on. Maybe we will see where we end up. Yep. Okay. Thank you for taking your time. Michael. No, no, you appreciate it, man. Have a good one. Thanks okay. so much. Thank you. Yeah.